Our next lecture in the series will be focusing on the lung. The lung is one of the largest organs in the body. It consists of airways lined with epithelial cells from the pharynx to the alveoli as it passes through the trachea, bronchi and bronchioles as can be seen in the diagram on the left. The breathing is facilitated by muscles like the diaphragm. It allows for the exchange of gases in the alveoli, which are tiny air sacs surrounded by blood vessels called capillaries, which bring deoxygenated blood to the alve alveoli from the pulmonary artery in the heart and oxygenated blood to the heart via the pulmonary vein. This gas exchange is facilitated by the very thin walls that can be seen between the epithelial cells and capillaries on the diagram on the right. To be able to assess toxicity, it is important to be able to measure lung physiology or function. There are a number of different air volume measures that can be used. These are shown here in the graph on the right, which indicate the air volume on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. Total lung capacity is the volume in the lungs at maximum inflation. The residual volume then is the volume of air remaining in the lungs after a maximal exhalation. The expiratory reserve volume is the maximal volume of air that can be exhaled from the end expiratory position. The inspiratory reserve volume is the maximum volume that can be inhaled from the end inspiratory level. Inspiratory vital capacity is the maximum volume of air inhaled from the point of expir maximum expiration. And the vital capacity is equal to the total lung capacity minus the residual volume. Functional residual capacity is the volume in the lungs at the end expiratory position. The airway may be thought of as distinct regions, especially when it comes to particles entering the lungs. These are shown on the slide where the diagram indicates three distinct regions. In blue, there's the nasopharyngeal region. In green, there is the tracheobronchial region. And in orange, there is the alveolar regions. The graphs on the right indicate the size of particles that tend to get deposited in that region of the airway. As is visible on the graph, large particles tend to deposit in the nasopharyngeal region, whereas smaller particles tend to travel further down to the airway, uh, through the airway to the tracheobronchial and alveolar regions. When we inhale gases and particles that shouldn't be there, we have a number of defense mechanisms we can use to remove them. Firstly, the epithelial cells that line the airway contain cilia and mucus produced by goblet cells, as well as surfactant, which is a type of detergent. These help trap particles in the mucus. In addition, the cilia beat slowly, which moves the mucus up the airway until it comes to the throat and can be swallowed. These then gets destroyed by stomach acid. In addition, immune cells surround the alveoli, like macrophages and neutrophils, and these can phagocytose and destroy any particles which make their way down that far. Rapid removal lessens the time available to cause damage to the pulmonary tissue and permit local absorption. This can occur in each of the main regions of the airway. Nasal clearance in the interior can be removed by wiping and blowing of the nose. In other regions, uh, mucociliary clearance propels mucus to the glottis, glottis where it is swallowed. Tracheobronchial clearance involves the mucus layer moved upwards by beating cilia and a mucociliary escalator, as it's known, transports deposited particles to the oropharynx where they are swallowed. Pulmonary clearance all, can also um, involve uh, mucociliary clearance and also particles can be phagocytosed by macrophages and removed by clearance or by the lymphatic drainage. Finally, some particles may actually penetrate the epithelial cells lining the airway. The diagram shows an alveolus highlighting the size of the particles and the mechanisms by which they are normally deposited and cleared. In most cases, particles that end up here are less than five microns and can settle by sedimentation or just simple Brownian diffusion. They will be cleared by mucociliary clearance and phagocytosis by macrophages, and in some cases by chemical interaction for very small particles or chemicals. The nasal airways are normally involved in the modification of inhaled air, such as humidifying it, warming it, and filtering air. It is involved in the metabolism of numerous xenobiotics or fun, for, foreign agents as they express P54 metabolizing enzymes. This makes areas like the nasal cavity, cavity 
nasopharynx, oropharynx, and the laryngopharynx shown in the diagram here, vulnerable to injury. These are the first groups of cells exposed to any inhaled irritants. Metabolism of these inhaled and sometimes non-inhaled toxicants can lead to the formation of toxic metabolites, which can then cause severe injury to the nasal epithelium. Toxicant-induced injury in the nasal passages can be neoplastic or non-neoplastic, meaning a creation of new cells or involved the not creation of new cells. For example, hyperplasia can be caused by chemicals like glucuraldehyde. Inflammation, on the other hand, can be caused by gases like sulfur dioxide. Neoplastic or cancerous lesions involving the formation of carcinomas uh, can be caused by the likes of dust from metals like nickel, ionizing radiation, wood dust, uh, formaldehyde and leather dust as well. The tracheobronchial region is next in the air pathway. The trachea is supplied with basal cells, ciliated cells, secretory cells, as shown in the diagram here in the bottom right. A defensive mucus lining layer consists of water, salts, immunoglobulins, enzymes, antibacterial agents and antioxidants. And these are used to prevent particles and microorganisms from causing damage. So in essence, their functions are to maintain sterility and act as a protective barrier. A mucociliary escalator involves small cilia on epithelial cells beating slowly and moving mucus that has trapped particles up the airway. It also provides an extracellular surface for the actions of things like immunoglobulins and enzymes. Acute injury can involve disruption of the tracheobronchial epithelium through cell injury, through necrosis and hypersecretion of, of chemicals leading to inflammation. This leads to a, an altered airway function um, as well as further inflammatory mediator release. This further damages the tissue and increases the airway resistance and responsiveness. Airway clearance of particles are also impaired as a result, so this makes it even more susceptible to injury. In an adult human lung, the surface of the air blood barrier is approximately about 100 meters squared. This is due to the millions of individual alveoli, shown in the diagram here on the right, in the lungs. Alveolar epithelial cells have an average thickness of about 1 to 2 microns, a cross-section of which is shown here on the bottom right of the slide. This highlights some of the other cells that are neighbours, including macrophages as well as capillaries. The entire cardiac output passes through the pulmonary capillaries, um, which means it has systemic exposure to many toxicants. This makes it a primary target during toxic insult. It eliminates inhaled particles and microorganisms, and it can be damaged by certain gases like nit nitrogen dioxide, as well as by solvents, organic chemicals, formaldehyde, for example, uh, pesticides, uh, some heavy metals, and uh, particles like asbestos or silica. Some of the main factors involved in lung toxicity include water solubility. Because gases can vary in terms of their water solubility and their toxicity as a result. For example, highly soluble gases such as sulfur dioxide do not penetrate further than the nose and are relatively less toxic to other regions. Whereas relatively insoluble gases such as ozone and nitrogen dioxide penetrate deeply into the lungs and reach the smallest airways in the alveoli where they can elicit a toxic response. Very insoluble gases such as carbon monoxide and hydrogen sulfide efficiently pass into the pulmonary blood supply to be distributed around the body. Particle size also matters. Larger particles, as we've seen already, usually distribute to the upper layers of the lung, while smaller particles get distributed to the alveoli. The patterns and the speed of breathing as well can determine the site of deposition. For example, exercise can increase deposition, as does breath holding. Deposition can be a major factor in toxicity. Mechanisms for deposition include interception, impaction, sedimentation, and diffusion. These are il illustrated on the diagram on the right. Interception, for example, is concerned with the tra trajectory of a particle that brings it in contact with the airway surface. Impaction means that at airway bifurcation, where it splits in two, a particle may be impacted onto that particular surface. Sedimentation occurs mostly in the bronchioles and alveoli, where gravitational forces act in a downward direction. 
The fusion involves random Brownian yolk motion and the particles can eventually come in contact with a particular area of the lungs. We will now examine some conditions that can develop as a result of lung toxicity. We will look at emphysema first of all. This is characterized by irreversible destruction of alveolar structures with airspace enlargement that's not associated with fibrosis. This is shown in the diagram here on the right and in the lung biopsy uh, shown on the bottom. Notice that the septum has broken down in the diseased tissue. Toxicants become trapped in the alveoli, causing a localized inflammatory response. Chemicals released during the inflammation, such as the enzyme elastase, cause the alveolar septum to disintegrate. This leads to chronic airflow obstruction, causing the air to become trapped in the lungs. In addition, the number of alveolar capillaries decrease over time, and this also impairs oxygen exchange. Like liver fibrosis, lung fibrosis involves the deposition of collagen and the formation of scar tissue, as can be seen on the biopsy on the right. It involves the formation or development of excess fib fibrous connective tissue in the lungs. This leads to the shortness of breath or dyspnea, um, chronic coughing, chest weakness and discomfort. It can be a secondary effect of other diseases such as asbestosis or silicosis. It's irre irreversible and a transplant is often needed. There is a gradual exchange over time of normal lung cells with fibrotic tissue because of this collagen deposition. Cell insult by toxicants lead to abnormal differentiation instead of repair. It's also a progressive condition where finally there is an irreversible decrease in oxygen diffusion capacity. Tobacco is a major toxicant of the lungs. It comes from the leaves of uh, Nicotinia tobaccum, the plant here shown on the right. There are established pulmonary car carcinogens in, in tobacco smoke that include things like polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. Cigarettes also contain some heavy metals like nickel, chromium, cadmium, uh, radioactive substances like polonium-210, as well as arsenic and hydrazine. Among the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons in cigarette smoke, uh, benzoapyrene uh, is probably the most extensively studied compound. Cigarette smoke also contains free radicals and these can induce oxidative damage to cells. There is also uh, the formation of what are called DNA adducts. So these DNA adducts can form from tobacco specific nitrosamines. In particular, NNK, shown in the diagram here on the right, is quite prevalent in cigarette smoke. As can be seen from this diagram, it can be metabolized by a number of different cytochrome P450 enzymes. Cytochrome P452A6 in the liver metabolizes NNK, for example, but so also does cytochrome P452A13 in the respiratory tract. But the cytochrome P452A13 is a hundredfold more efficient at metabolic activation of NNK meaning it forms more toxic metabolites that can then attach to DNA forming these adducts. NNK specifically causes lung cancer. Lung cancer is the most common cancer in men, are 1 million deaths annually. Smokers have a 10 to 20 fold increased risk of developing lung cancer compared to non-smokers. 90% of lung cancers begin in the bronchi, otherwise known as bronchogenic carcinoma, as shown in the diagram here on the right. Smoking is the cause of 80 to 90% of these cases, with the remaining 5 to 10% caused by other toxicants such as asbestos, heavy metals and radiation. There are more than 60 carcinogens in cigarette smoke and at least 16 in un unburnt tobacco. Mechanisms the cause cancer center on DNA damage caused by the adducts mentioned previously from chemicals and or from reactive oxygen species. As mentioned already, asbestos can lead to fibrosis. Asbestos, shown in the diagram here on the right, is formed from chrysotile, uh, otherwise known as white, which consists of alternating layers of magnesium hydroxide and silicon dioxide. It is found in asbestos cement products used in water pipes and construction materials, 
also in insulating materials like tiles and, and fireproofing, as well as in friction materials like brake and clutch linings. Finally, they can also be seen sometimes in textiles like in cloth and yarn. Therefore, it can be an occupational risk to the likes of miners, construction workers, textile workers and non-occupationally exposed individuals also. Long-term exposure can lead to a condition called asbestosis. This results in the accumulation of asbestos particles as is illustrated in the diagram here on the right. Fibre deposition leads to macrophage recruitment and phagocytosis of the fibres. Fibre translocation involves the active uptake by type 1 epithelial cells. Fibres get cleared from the epithelial cytoplasm to the interstitial space and then get phagocytosed by macrophages that are neighbouring these cells. This leads to the release of growth factors and cytokines leading to a fibrogenic response. This involves cell proliferation and the proliferative response and repair mechanisms take place. Asbestos related lung fibrosis involves inflammation, cell injury and cell repair. Finally, there are a number, number of chemicals that are not inhaled but are bloodborne and that can still cause lung toxicity. As we've said already, the lungs receive 100% of cardiac output, so any blood that does enter the lungs um, containing toxic chemicals can cause damage at this point. These chemicals include paraquat, monocratiline, bleomycin and cyclophosphamide as examples. Paraquat, which is a herbicide, um, exposure to which leads to initial widespread necrosis, extensive proliferation of fibroblasts in the alveolar interstitium, and the formation of reactive oxygen species which can damage these cells. Monocratiline, which is found in some grains and teas, is metabolized by cytochrome P450 enzymes, in particular 3A enzymes, um, to a reactive pyrrole version of this molecule. This travels to the lungs where it initiates endothelial injury of the, of the capillaries. Bleomycin, on the other hand, which is a chemotherapeutic agent, produces pulmonary fibrosis via capillary endothelial cell necrosis, via oedema, which is a swelling, and hemorrhage fibrotic thickening of alveoli. Cyclophosphamide, which is also a chemotherapeutic and also immunosuppressant drug, is metabolized by cytochrome P450 um, to acrolein and phosphamide mustard, which can initiate lipid peroxidation of um, the alveolar epithelial cells.